<laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to Ace Lab 360. Uh, today we have two guests. We have Valentina Feldman and Ethan Miller. Uh, Valentina just finished her master's degree in digital media here at Drexel University back in June. And Ethan is a senior in the animation and visual effects program. And you know, disclaimer, I worked on a project with the two of them last year, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. So the project was a documentary for a dinosaur that had been discovered by a Drexel paleontologist at the time. And uh, Val, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the dinosaur and why this was produced in 360. Great, thanks Nick. Uh, well, as Nick mentioned, Dreadnoughtus VR was created for my master's thesis at Drexel, where I was really looking to study how to create an engaging science documentary in virtual reality. And uh, it stars Dreadnoughtus, one of the largest dinosaurs ever discovered. And uh, as you also mentioned, I worked with the team 3D scanning the bones of this dinosaur. Uh, so we had a lot of the assets already there. Um, and then the reason why we chose virtual reality for this is because science illustration for the longest time have really been flat in the way that they communicate scale. And for something as large as Dreadnoughtus, which weighed more than 12 elephants or 900 adult human beings of an average size and weight, uh, that's kind of impossible to communicate to an audience who maybe has never seen one elephant before. So uh, in the essence of trying to tell the world how special this specific creature is, we use virtual reality to kind of break the barriers between how we show and how we tell what creatures that are extinct look like. Right, so this was you know, a fairly high-end 360 degree video production back when that wasn't really much of a thing. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the technologies behind that, but it also meant then that all the motion graphics that would be created needed to be in something entirely different because you know, the lower thirds for traditional rectangular stuff didn't work, and so that's where Ethan came in. And, and Ethan, you were making the motion graphics, so you know, tell us a little bit about how that came together. Yeah, so uh, motion graphics in VR differ a bit from traditional kind of 2D motion graphics because you can't just slap a, a 2D picture in the environment and call it a day. Uh, we actually went through and we created full 3D models of all our motion graphics complete with uh, HDR environment lighting and stereoscopic rendering. It was really important to us that the motion graphics don't feel like a cheesy kind of tacked on nature documentary deal, but like they were actually part of the space, part of the experience. And uh, yeah, cool. So, you know, we had, Ethan had the motion graphics portion of things solved, and then we knew that as a location for the live action recording, we would go to the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, so that's part of Drexel University here in Philadelphia, and we mm -hmm. had wonderful Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton as our <laughs> backdrop and all, but you know, there, there were a whole pile of problems to solve there as well in terms of, number one, how we were going to record it in the first place. We didn't want to use GoPro rigs. Uh, we wanted to use professional studio grade cameras. And at the time that we were planning this back in, I guess this was actually 2015. Yeah, the shoot was in March, so yeah. a full year and, and ago. That was, you see, it was March of 2016 that we did the shoot, right? right. Mm -hmm. And planning had started back in 2015. September. So, and, so September. So the cameras that we used, we really, really wanted. We knew Blackmagic was coming out with these Micro Studio 4K cameras, but they weren't shipping yet, and our fingers were crossed that they would start <laughs> shipping in time. Uh, so we, we got lucky, they started shipping in November, we got a pair right away. We were so excited to have two cameras to shoot virtual reality. Oh yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. That was astounding how far it's come only a year later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, the nice thing about these, unlike GoPros, is we could tie these into a camera controller. We had full control over white balance, shutter speed, all of the camera settings could be operated remotely from off camera. Um, we were recording ProRes 4K from each eye, but then there were some other issues such as what lenses to use and um, how exactly we were going to use just two cameras yeah. to record stereoscopic 360. So, um, you know, for that we ended up using this uh, gimbal rig. This is actually intended for sports photographers to use, you know, the very hot, heavy uh, telephoto lenses. So it pivots really nicely. Um, so we could mount two cameras to this and we could pivot them up and down to shoot our Zenith and Naders. And of course it also pivots so that we could shoot talent in one direction, get that recorded, and then uh, spin around and record the rest of the room. We also had another advantage. I mean, Ethan was working lights for us and, and taking care of all of that. And so <laughs> by shooting this, we call it asynchronous, 
we had some other advantages with the lighting, right? Yeah, uh, we were actually able to, um, you know, kind of comp in our environment before we put the lights in. Uh, we took an environment, or took a picture of the environment before we put any of the lights up. Then we put the lights up, used compositing to make the environment seem like, you know, it was naturally lit at that point. Um, I mean, lighting it was definitely a challenge. You know, these black magics need a lot of light to really get them to sing. Um, and the whole idea of having to try to hide our lights throughout the space really made lighting an, an interesting challenge, a lot different than a traditional 2D shoot which I've been a part of in the past. Um, there's also the problem of, you know, you're more than just lighting a, a character in a space, you're lighting the entire environment. So like, we had extra lights on the balconies, you know, filling out the rest of the environment. Um, you know, I like the real cool. key lights that you use to uh, bring out the environment, like the dinosaurs in the background had spotlights on them. Because in VR, you really want the entire environment to be interesting. You don't want people to have binoculars looking straight forward, you want them to explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we actually had like going down throughout the whole multiple spotlights on key environments. So like even while the the users like maybe they're not looking directly at the uh, character at that point, but they're still engaging in the rest of the space and still able to explore it visually. Right, and that really led to the way that staging was put together. So that you know here here we are in the Academy of Natural Sciences, huge Tyrannosaurus Rex, all sorts of other dinosaur displays and uh, skeletons, and so we wanted to make sure that we you know lit that so that we could see the things <laughs> that we wanted to see and strategically not light some of the areas that we <laughs> didn't necessarily wanted to highlight. There's, right. there's, there's a bone, you, you have a bone to pick with. <laughs> I do have a bone to pick with a bone. Uh, one of the fossils at the Academy of Natural Sciences was an ultrasaurus and we wanted to really highlight how large Dreadnoughtus was because Dreadnoughtus was in the background within a frame when we first see it, having a giant leg of another large dinosaur closer in the <laughs> foreground was slightly problematic. So we did a scouting um, mission beforehand to figure out well, first, how many power outlets do we have access to? Where can we hide <laughs> the people on the shoot when we want to do the rest of the asynchronous capture? So many power strips. So many power strips, exactly. Uh, so we, uh, the Rico Theta, because that had just come out at the time, was really valuable in just being able to sync it to our phone and wander around and say, oh, this is the spot. This is where we're shooting. Right, right. <laughs> so we were able to go ahead of time and shoot full 360 photos uh, on demand, moving around on the stand and, and really kind of pinpoint this is the spot where in all directions in 360 degrees you have a good view of something and we can hide our can actors plan. behind the walls yeah, <laughs> and, and the crew and also so that uh, so that all worked out um, and then ultimately I mean I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to share in terms of the 360 production right, because right. not all of it was the live action piece with motion graphics over it you also created a fully CG segment in there that talked more about the discoveries the bones and you know, what went into creating that? Exactly. So uh, there is a segment where we transition from the Academy of Natural Sciences to uh, an approximation of southern Patagonia, this large desert where Dronatus was dug up. So in this segment, we show the 3D scans of the bones while Dr. Lacavera narrates and shows where the muscle attachment scars were and the humerus, for example, really giving a lot of uh, scientific content as well as the very striking visuals of there are bones flying around me and that one <laughs> is seven feet tall. So by merging the uh, very scientific narrative with a flat environment that really sh allowed us to focus in on the 3D scans. Um, we saw a lot of success in our user testing. We were able to use a lot of motion graphics here too that showed off oh, yeah. a lot of the kind of uh, the scanning, the development, the kind of the behind the scenes science that we wouldn't have normally been able to feature uh, throughout the documentary, which is nice. And that was a huge aspect of this is that you were working from actual 3D scans of bones that, you know, <laughs> some of these bones are yeah, let me see if I can several, many, many feet in length. Um, and then you had to <laughs> convert those scans, the raw data of that, into something that was, you know, something that could be managed <laughs> in a single computer in Maya, and you could animate that. But yeah. you still wanted to have all the the details, so you were converting scans into normal maps. I got a lot of really good insights from that process. At first, to save on render time because we didn't have many computers with enough RAM to process <laughs> high <laughs> displacement maps from thousands upon thousands of polygons. Pretty Sure, you so, burned out a few machines. A couple. 
uh, but <laughs> we use bump maps at first, and bump maps use the distance from the camera in their calculations. So if we have a stereoscopic camera that are offset slightly, you will get seam lines even when there are no seam lines if you use a bump map. So thinking of the entire process as physically plausible, no bump maps, we use displacement maps. We have to make them work. Uh, that was a challenge um, because this was also back before V-Ray had a render and stereoscopic button. Mm -hmm. that, it, it came out like a month after we finished production, so uh, that's the bleeding edge for you. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way we roll, right? Right, and then uh, in addition, just to wrap up that, uh, we also had to sculpt the rest of the dinosaur because Dreadnoughtus was not a complete specimen. It was very complete, but we did have a very collaborative process with a lot of volunteers and artists, uh, which eventually, several steps later, led <laughs> to having a full skeleton, muscle system, and skin as well. So. I, think, uh, I think one of my favorite parts <laughs> of the process was going out to Toronto and getting photogrammetry scans of... Oh, uh, Dreadnoughtus' cousin, yeah. <laughs> so uh, a few of the neck bones were missing, so we road tripped to Toronto for 12 hours and then uh, brought a DSLR and took hundreds of pictures of another titanosaur and then were able to grab some of the data from there as well. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of an expedition just bringing it back to life. <laughs> sure, sure. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for the insights into you know how this came to be. The actual 360 documentary is on Jaunt VR. Uh, we'll include a link in the show notes for you so you can go see it there. And go watch uh, it. You know, if that, uh, <laughs> you know, if it's of interest, we'll have these guys back and talk about the production a little bit more. So until next time, have fun. Oh, awesome. Thanks for having us, Nick.